essentially uh, pretty much what the paper is about and the contribution to the literature of the paper. I'm going to spend some time on the data. I think that this is probably the most interesting thing for this paper. Um, the methodology, I'll, I'll spend a little bit uh, of time on that and then I'll go to the results. But uh, the, really the thing that I want to, to, to discuss, uh, I mean compared to the standard presentation, I'm going to spend more time on, on the data than I would normally do. Uh, so. So before I actually get to all these things, uh, let me kind of give you the brief message of what the paper is about. So the paper is about leverage buyouts. Um, and what we study is the, the how leverage buyouts, uh, what's the relationship between leverage buyouts and innovation. Essentially, we contrast, uh, we study three different types of innovation, technological innovation, non-technological innovation, and innovation-related activities. And we essentially contrast two theoretical perspectives on LBOs. On the one hand, you have these efficiency perspectives, so that LBOs will increase the efficiency of companies. And on the other hand, you have the strategic entrepreneurship literature that says that you know, when the LBO comes, you have a kind of a rebirth of the company. Uh, so these two different views on LBOs yield to different hypotheses of what's going to happen to innovation. Uh, well, we, we have a sample of about 1,000 LBOs. Uh, these are in the UK, uh, and we are using the CIS, the Community Innovation, Innovation Survey data. The, uh, essentially, what we find is that uh, there is a lot of difference on the impact that you have on, on innovation, uh, and there is a lot of difference on which of the two theories better describes the LBO, depending on whether you are in uh, low-tech or high-tech industries. There's, a, there's really two completely different behaviors. And the, um, so that's, that's pretty much what I'm, what I'm going to show you. Uh, now, just a just definition, what's a, what's a leverage buyout? Now, leverage buyout is, um, 
uh, is two things. It's a buyout, uh, so it's, an, it's a partial or, or total acquisition of a company, and it's leveraged, which means that that is used to, to uh, fund the, this acquisition. It, and it's typically carried uh, over by a, by a private equity fund or by a financial intermediary, specialized financial intermediary. The, the typical objective of an LBO is essentially to buy the company, improve the performance, and sell it. Um, that would typically, typically take between five to ten years, so five to seven. And um, so there is this value improvement. So between the time you buy the company to the time you sell it, you have to improve the value. So the point is how these value improvement activities will uh, impact innovation, which is what we care about. Uh, so as I was mentioning, you have these two broad views. On the one hand, you have the, uh, I'll call it the efficiency view that's grounded in the agency theory. Essentially, the idea is that uh, this is also the, the way that LDOs are often described in the, say, uh, the, uh, in the popular press. Uh, so in newspaper articles, whenever, whenever people are criticizing the deals, they say, you know, they buy, they buy these companies and they, they, they fire people, then they, they cut those companies into pieces and then sell the pieces, right? It's a kind of a negative view uh, of this efficiency uh, process uh, that, that co these companies go through. So the idea, just, just to put it very, very schematically, uh, the deals will cut to the bone all the costs, uh, including the costs that are related to innovation, right? So, since they're, 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 they are relatively short-term investors because they would sell the companies after five to ten years, you know that that, that time horizon is shorter than uh, the time that innovation would take. So you, what what might happen is that it would cut innovation costs because that would improve, uh, at least in the short term, the the profitability of the company. So that's the first view over LBOs. Second view over LBOs. Um, is that LBOs will release the hidden potential of these companies. So the, these, uh, these LBO, these private equity are investing in companies that are mature, uh, where managers don't have enough uh, stock or performance-based compensation. Uh, so the, the private equity comes to the company with additional resources, high-powered incentives, and gives a rebirth over the company. So that's a completely different kind of narrative over a deal compared to the efficiency. So you have these two narratives. Uh, we, on, a more, on a more, say, academic um, way of describing these uh, two different narratives, on the one hand, this efficiency view is grounded in the, in the agency theory. So if you go back to the very first paper on LBOs, uh, on, on, it's essentially papers where you have managers that are, uh, you know, they, they have too many uh, free cash flows, they don't know what to do with this money, and then they start doing uh, non-productive investments just because you know they have fun out of that. So they are extracting private benefits by that. And the comes, uh, increases the debt, this reduces the free cash flows, improves the efficiency of the company. So essentially, that's that's how the efficiency is linked to the AGP theory. Then a later um, and more managerial kind of literature uh, is the literature that is based on resource-based theory and describes how the capability of the managers are enhanced when this external uh, investor comes with new abilities, new perspectives, and new objectives, right? So it comes from revitalizing the company. Um, skip that. Now, uh, what can we say about innovation? So um, essentially, the, uh, the, the, the agency view and the strategic entrepreneurship view, they, they focus on slightly different things. Um, the, uh, the agency used to say the efficiency improvement is more about the, the investments in innovation more than in the outputs of the innovation. I mean, clearly the two things are related, uh, but, but the perspective is more on the cost of innovation. And uh, one thing you have with LDOs, if you think that they will actually be efficiency improvers, right, so if they improve the efficiency, one thing that they will do is that they will target companies that are inefficient. So if you want to take the, the if you want to see this in the perspective of innovation, one thing that would, we would expect to see if the efficiency view is true is that LPOs will target companies that have above average innovation expenses, so that you know innovation expenses are going to be part of the costs that are going to be cut. So what you would expect is to see that LPOs will target companies with above average innovation expenses or activities, and that these innovation expenses will, dec will decrease after the LPO. Right? So you, if, if you are an efficiency seeker, 
or an efficiency prover, you will see companies that are inefficient and make them efficient. efficient. So you expect to see above average investments before the LBO and then a decrease after the LBO. So that's essentially the, the, the dynamic you would expect to see if the agency view is correct. Right? So it's about the target and what happened to the target after the LBO. Now, if you look at the, at the strategic entrepreneurship view and try to uh, uh, tell an innovation story based on the strategic entrepreneurship view, uh, then there is not much to say about, about the innovation costs or the innovation activities. What, what the, uh, I mean, what, what the, um, or at least there's not much to say about what happens before the LBO. What the, the strategic entrepreneurship view is about is about what happens after the LBO. Uh, and essentially, long story short, if the strategic entrepreneurship view is correct, what you would expect to see is an increase in innovation-related activities, technological innovation, and non-technological innovation. Now, uh, we, we're not making any hypothesis on, uh, on, um, uh, on the output of innovation according to the agency view, because the agency view is, I mean, predicting a reduction in the cost of innovation, but not, that doesn't necessarily imply a reduction in the output of innovation. Because the company is becoming more efficient, so it's, it could be making the same output with less input. So the less input is really the part of the, that the agency theory is about. It's not really the less output. Uh, what the strategic entrepreneurship view is about is about an increase in the input and the output. So you see, these the, two theories focus on slightly different things. As I try to, uh, to summarize here in these, in these uh, kind of two uh, by three metrics. So uh, on, the, on the rows of these metrics, you have the three dimensions of innovation that we would focus upon. So the innovation-related activities, which are somehow conceptually related to the costs of innovation. Uh, you have the output, the technological output, and the non-technological output of innovation. Right? And then you have the two time dimensions, what's happening before the LBO and what's happening after the LBO. So essentially, the, the red hypotheses are what comes from the agency theory. So the agency theory was will predict really, uh, higher than average innovation related activities before the LVO that will then go down. The, um, the, the, the strategic entrepreneurship view would, would instead predict something that is about the post LVO. It's kind of uh, nuanced about what's happening before the LVO. Uh, the LVO, sorry. And the, um, that, the, the, the strategic entrepreneurship view would essentially predict an increase in the innovation related activities in the technological innovation and the non technological innovation. So, for the large part, the two theories uh, do not overlap because they look at slightly different things. The only real part where the two theories have uh, predictions that are clearly opposed is in what's happening for innovation related activities after the LBO, where the agency theory would predict the decline and the strategic inter entrepreneurship theory would predict an increase. Uh, apart from that, the other hypotheses are kind of independent or orthogonal between the two, uh, the two theories. Okay, so how do you test this? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this later. Um, now, how do you test this? So the problem, there are essentially um, two problems with testing these. Uh, these are, I'll get it here. So there are two problems with testing this. One um, is, a, is a data problem. Uh, the data problem comes to the fact that um, it is very hard to measure innovation. Right? It's very, very hard. Uh, and the literature has, has, has clearly focused a lot on the part of innovation that is easy to measure. That's what we always do, right? If you cannot measure it, you cannot write a paper on it. Uh, so uh, the, the part that is easier to measure that is innovation related is the R&D costs. Because they are accounting uh, figure, so it's something that you have available on a large scale of companies. Uh, so that's where you have a lot of, of research about R&D costs. The uh, problem is that that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of innovation that is not reflected into R&D costs. Uh, there are innovation activities like uh, design. Uh, it's not reflected in, uh, in uh, R&D activities. Uh, <laughs> software, uh, depending on where you are, is reflected or not in R&D activities. Um, and all the non-technological innovation is not reflected into R&D. If you change the organizational structure of your company, or if you create a new uh, way of working, uh, that's not going to be patented because that's another measure of innovation, and it's not going to be R&D. 
So the problem is that the literature is very much focused on a very narrow thing. Um, and so what, what we wanted to do is to have a broader uh, perspective of innovation. Um, second, the, the, these two theories, the agency and the research, depend, uh, research dependence theory, uh, they are kind of used, some papers use one, some other papers use the other. Uh, there are actually very few papers that try to contrast them and see which one actually applies when. Uh, which, which is what we try to do. Um, so how do you uh, measure innovation that is hard to measure? Now here comes the data part of, the, of, the, of, my, of my presentation. So uh, we are using the UK CIS uh, survey. So the CIS is the Community Innovation Survey. It's a survey that is administered by the UK, uh, well, this is a European survey. Every country has its own. Spain has its own, Italy has its own, France has its own, the UK has its own. Uh, so we focused on the UK because uh, if you want to look at LVOs and you have to pick a country, that's probably you've got to pick the UK. Uh, that's the country where you have the largest LVO uh, market in Europe at least, uh, probably in the world. So the, the, this survey is about innovation and there is plenty of information about innovation. Uh, the, the, the good thing is that it's, it's very detailed, the measure of, of innovations that you would typically not get. Here you have a list of um, uh, questions that are asked to these company, companies. So uh, if you are responding in, into, the, into the community innovation survey, you get questions about whether the company has brought new and improved products on the market, including tangible goods and the provision of services uh, in the three previous business years. So you get the, 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 the survey in, uh, say, 2012, and the question is about any new product that was brought on the market in the three previous years. And you get the same for processes, whether a new or significant change in corporate strategy was carried over uh, during the three years, whether the there was any organizational change during the three years, a change in marketing, uh, manage uh, the adoption of advanced management techniques. Then you also have R&D, that's part, that's part of the broader picture. Uh, whether there was any cooperation with other companies for, for pursuing uh, innovation. Uh, training, so whether there was any innovation related training to, their, to, the, to the employees, and whether there was any redesign of, of the products. Right? So you have all this very detailed information about what the company has done in the previous three years. Uh, so what we want to do is to see whether um, LBOs affect uh, post LBO or whether they are attracted by companies that have specific characteristics along these different dimensions. The, um, so what we do, uh, we get from, um, from Capital IQ, uh, we get uh, the list of 4,635 LBOs completed in the UK from 1998 to 2008. So we get this list. And we send it to the, uh, the ONS, that's the, uh, the, the UK uh, National Statistics Organization, so Organization of National Statistics, and they matched these 4,000 LBOs, uh, 4,600 LBOs, with all the 45, nearly 46,000 respondents to the survey for three waves, CIS 4, 5, and 6. So each wave is about three years, right? So for instance, CIS 4, is about years from 2002 to 2004. So the CIS is set in 2005, asking about the previous two years. Then you have CIS 5, that's about 2004 to 2006, and CIS 6, 2006 to 2008. Now the respondents aren't always the same. So it's a, it's a random draw from the population of companies. And there are actually very, very few companies that respond to both the CIS 4 and 5, or the five and six, and there's essentially no company that responds to the three. Um, so we got these, these capital IQ information and uh, UK CIS information uh, merged or, or crossed. Um, then we drop information observations with incomplete data and, and, uh, and information about LBOs that uh, occurred uh, four more years before the observation period because that, that's complicating the, the, the framework yeah. unnecessarily. And so we get with a final sample of about 1,000 LVOs and about 20,000 known LVOs. So companies that have nothing to do with LVOs. Now, uh, there are good and bad of working with the CIS data. Uh, 
So the good thing about the CIS data is that essentially you get very, very uh, detailed information about innovation, something you couldn't get uh, otherwise. Um, the sample is very large, and it's a very, very high quality because it's the job of the ONS to check that these data are reliable, and they really do that. So you have a very high response rate uh, and, a ve and a very thoughtful job after they get the responses to cross-check that these responses are reliable and make sense. Uh, and then, you know, it's the UK, so for LBOs, that's the place to do this, this type of analysis. So these are the go this, that's a good side of the deal. Now, the bad side of the deal, the CIS microdata are anonymized, so we don't know who the respondent was, which means that we cannot add additional information to this data set. So the only information we have comes from, the, from this data set, Plus, we know which of those companies are LBOs. But that's all we know. We don't know the name of the company, which means that any other type of information that you would like to have about these companies, you're not going to have it. So like accounting information, it's not part of the CIS, you're not going to have it. So you know, you have some pros and some cons. The other, the other problem we have with the CIS data, that's more kind of a personal problem, is that you have very strict privacy laws, and every time you want to write a regulation, you have to go to London. Check in into the into the ONS, into the ONS, go into this office where there's no internet connection, nothing. You get a, a computer that's kind of 1984 computer with the only thing you have there is data and the data. You do your regressions, you, you print it out, they check that there's no sense, no kind of uh, privacy breach in the in your printouts, and you get and you get those back home. So I mean the. Uh, the, the typical back and forth that you have between, you know, I have an idea, I want to see whether that works or not, you cannot do that in this kind of thing. So that's, that's, a, that's a serious uh, problem we have with using the, 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 this UK CIS data. Um, now, another problem that, that we have, uh, oh wow, another problem we have is that um, LBOs are not random, are not, that's not a random treatment, so the LBO company isn't a random company. Uh, so you have to control for, for, for the causality versus correlation issue that we uh, have to deal with very often. Now, what we typically do, uh, Sam and I have been doing that, I don't know, many times, is to use panel data. So you have repeated observation of the same company and with fixed effects or some other kind of uh, dynamic panel data, you, you, can, you can filter for, for endogeneity pretty efficiently. Now, probably you you cannot do it here because you don't have repeated observation for the same company. So you have to find a way to do that in, the, in a cross-sectional way. So the way we do that is that essentially we compare, because, I mean, we, so say that this is the CIS4 uh, window. So CIS4 is, I'm asking a company in 2005 whether they have introduced any new product uh, between 2002 and 2004. Now, I observe companies that are post-LBO, which means that they have, been LBO'd, so they've been acquired in the three years before or during the observation period. So a company that was an LBO company is in 2000, I observed the innovation in 2002 to 2004, so the innovation of that company is influenced by the fact that they had an LBO previously. But I also observed companies that haven't yet had an LBO, but they will have it in the future, because I know that. company didn't know at the time, but I know now that that company in 2006 will be LBO'd. So what I can do is to compare post-LBO with pre-LBO companies. It's not the same company. I mean, if this was panel, uh, the panel data set, they would be the same company. You observe the company before and after something happens. Here, you cannot do it. It's not the same company. It's different companies, that, but you observe some of those companies after the LBO and some other companies after the LBO. Uh, and so you compare the two. And to the extent to which uh, the, um, say, the selection process hasn't changed uh, between uh, 2001 and 2005, uh, so that these companies are more or less selected uh, reason in a reasonably close uh, way, uh, the, the pre-LBOs should look pretty much like the post-LBO would look like without the LBO. So essentially we use this uh, difference in this kind of pseudo difference in difference analysis. Uh, so that's the idea. And we do that in two different ways. We do a real uh, propensity score matching, uh, matching the post with the pre-LBOs, uh, actually matching the post-LBOs with uh, a control group, 
and the three LDOs with a control group, and then taking a difference in difference. Uh, that's the first thing we do. Second thing we do, we use a, a standard um, uh, probic model. So um, a part is say one is a non parametric way of controlling for this endogeneity, and the other one is a parametric method of, of controlling for endogeneity. Um, the two methods give similar um, similar results. So I'm just going to stick to um, to the results that we get from one of the two. Um, I don't have time for the for the descriptive statistics. It's fine. We have time. Okay. Then I'll, then I'll spend some time on the on the statistics. So the um, uh, on these these ones in particular. Uh, so here you have uh, the descriptive statistics about these are the, the our innovation variables. So just to give you an idea about how often these companies are actually innovating. Um, like 32.4% for product innovation means that out of all the respondents we have uh, of this UKCIS, about one third introduced new products on the market in the three previous years. Which means that these, these are companies that are not incredibly innovative. Uh, so two thirds of these companies have not introduced any new product on the market for, the, for three years. Uh, but this is, this is more or less what the, the average UK company and probably a European company will be very different uh, looks like. So uh, clearly there's a lot of difference if you then split the sample into two uh, different sectoral groups. Uh, the group that we call HTKIS, that's, which stands for High Tech Knowledge, Intens uh, Knowledge uh, Intensive Service Industries. So these are the high tech sectors. And then you have the medium and low tech sectors on the other column. So clearly, if you split between high tech and low tech, what you find is that you have a lot more innovation in high tech than you have in low tech, which is clearly not unexpected. Right? That's what you would expect to see. Uh, so if, if we uh, still look at product, so about half of the high tech companies introduce a new product on the market in a three year period, uh, and that's at only 25%, so one out of four for low-tech companies. So clearly, innovation is more common in high-tech than low-tech. Again, not, not particularly surprising. Um, so what we do, we um, pool all our, all our companies uh, in, a, in, a, in one sample. We do this pseudo difference in difference method. So we match the pre and the post uh, LDOs to a match sample. And then we take the difference in the difference. Bottom line. What we get is not much, uh, very very little, uh, if very very little significant effect, uh, both pre the LBO and as an effect of the LBO. So when you, long story short, if you take all the sectors and pull them together in a single sample, uh, what you get is a is a very mixed picture. Uh, that's that's the other that's the that's the profit method. Like you get more or less the same picture. So what, what, what you get is that you get a very strange partial support for the agency view and partial support for the strategic entrepreneurship view. So if you look at, for instance, here, so this is where the two hypotheses are conflicting or the two views are conflicting. Uh, the uh, agency theory would predict the minus sign and the, the strategic entrepreneurship theory would predict the plus sign. What we get is that we, we don't get very much in terms of significant result. And the only two things that are close to significance or significant, one is negative, the other one is positive. So it's not clear from this table whether we get support for the agency view or the strategic entrepreneurship view, but more or less we get no support for either. Right? You don't get much. Uh, so when we got to this, you know, this is the time when you would like to have time to think, go back home, and then after a week, do some other regressions. You cannot do that when you're in London, right? The following day, you have to come up with a new idea. So luckily, uh, we, we thought that one of the reasons why you could get this mixed picture is because you're, actually this is the superposition of two different things. Uh, you have one set of companies for which, for, for which one of the theory works, and then you have another set of companies for which the other theory works, and then when you mix them together, you, you don't see anything, right? Because it's blurred. Uh, and uh, the, the, we figured out that the technology intensity of the, of the sector would be a very good way of, of breaking the sample in two. Uh, this is an innovation paper 
So probably sectors that are more innovative, like the high-tech sectors, could behave differently from uh, sectors that are not particularly innovative, like low-tech sectors. So what we've done is then broke the sample in these two parts and uh, rerun our analysis. So this is for the low-tech sector. So what we get in the low-tech sector is we find a decently significant um, evidence that LBO targets in lower-tech sectors actually have higher than average uh, innovation activities before the LBO. So they, are, they have higher innovation activities. That's what the LBO is looking for because that's where it's going to cut the costs. And what we observe is that there's a significant reduction, not across the board, but we, all, we have all negative signs, and uh, one of them is significant here, and uh, it's significant there as well, uh, in the, with the other method. So we have, uh, that's a 1%, so two, two stars is 1%, significant level, uh, significant, statistically significant evidence that there is a reduction in that dimension of, of innovation activity. So this is broadly consistent with what you would expect to see according to the agency views. That's for low-tech industries. Now you look at high-tech industries, you get, you get a completely different picture. You don't have any plus sign here, so the, the LBO targets in high-tech industries aren't doing any above-average innovation activities before the LBO. That's not what they look like. But what you see is that you have a very substantial increase in innovation-related activities uh, where you had a decrease uh, in low-tech, you have an increase in high-tech, and you also have a significant increase in uh, non-technological innovation. You have absolutely no difference in technological innovation. This is true for these companies, high-tech, it's also true for the low-tech companies. Uh, they are somewhere over there. All right, so no change in technological innovation. So bottom line, split the sample in these two parts, low-tech, high-tech. And you get two completely different pictures. In low tech, you have above average PLBO innovation related activities, which is what we expected to see according to the agency theory. And you have a reduction in innovation related activities after the LBO, which is consistent with the, uh, the, the, the agency view of what would happen after the LBO. In the high tech sector, um, you get an increase in non-technological innovation, so the third hypothesis, our third hypothesis is supported, and you have an increase in innovation-related activity, so the opposite hypothesis says the agency wants to support it. Uh, we get absolutely no support for, for, for technological innovation, which is something that I think is, uh, is also an interesting uh, aspect. So, conclusions of the paper. Uh, the effect of LBOs of innovation on average is, very, is, is actually very limited. So if you pull all the LBO companies, you don't get a lot of effect. And th the reason is that you have very different effect depending on what company you're talking about. Uh, so it's not, that on it's not that for all the companies there's no effect. It's that the effect is opposite for different companies. Uh, so for medium and low tech companies, the efficiency view applies to innovation, so these companies are more uh, active in innovation before the LBO, and the, their innovation activity declines dramatically after the LBO. And for high-tech companies, uh, you see a very significant increase in both in uh, the innovation-related activities and in the non-technological innovation for these companies. The, um, now, you, one, one interesting thing uh, about the fact, so we don't find any uh, uh, any significant effect on technological innovation, which I find particularly fascinating. Because 90% uh, of the literature about innovation is about that, is about technological innovation, because that's the easy part to measure. So what our paper suggests, I mean, we are not proving this, we're not proving anything, but what, we, what we're actually suggesting is that by focusing on technological innovation, just because it's easy to measure, we are actually focusing on the, on the innovation dimension where you have the most limited effect. So it, it's easy to measure, but there's not much going on there. It's all the other dimensions of the innovation where you have a lot of changes. The problem is that since you cannot easily measure them, you, you don't see that happening. Um, and finally, uh, while we were in London, clearly this is not the only estimates we've done. We have a binder full of, of regressions. So we have uh, done regressions with different matching ratios, uh, different procedures, either without replacement, 
uh, we have changed the samples for, for the probit, uh, we changed the definition of what post LBO. So we've done a, a, some robustness tests, and uh, these results, they seem to hold whatever you do, uh, at least whatever we've done. So they are, they are pretty robust. Uh, that, that's it, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. You Well, I must say that uh, I uh, found it very interesting uh, lecture because uh, this study, I think, goes beyond the classical LBO studies that uh, only measures the results of the of the LBOs with one or two uh, variables. And as you can, sh as you have shown in the, in the, in the study. There are also some other points of view that are necessary to understand better the process that is under an LBO. So, um, and one of these points is the situation of the company in relation with uh, their knowledge and technology intensity. So, this is something that uh, all venture capital are looking for uh, before buying, but it is not obvious to all the average. And the results, you have shown it uh, very precisely. I think uh, the innovation and innovation-related activities are a source of uh, competitive advantage uh, for the companies, and uh, it's very important to know how this can affect to the companies, uh, depending on what kind of company are uh, the target of the LBO uh, or the private company that is looking for it. I think that uh, the difficulties of measuring innovation and, uh, and uh, the innovation-related activities you have solved uh, using this, uh, this way of uh, measuring the, the, the results, looking for other uh, characteristics of the companies that are not uh, so uh, measurable. I mean, you have to look for the number of people that are looking for uh, work, 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 they, that they have a degree, a technical degree, and that's something important because it's not only the products that you have, uh, but the opportunity that you have. So I think it's very interesting uh, the way that you have looked for that. Okay. Uh, um, uh, I think that uh, moreover, it, it proves that the effect of LBOs in not technolo technological innovation is distinctable. I mean, you can see it in the, in the figures that it's not something that it can be just taken into account as a, uh, as a mean of companies. You have to distinguish this because the effect is, is significant. So uh, that is something that is important for private company when they are working on, on looking for new companies. Okay. Uh, and I would like to ask you some, some questions in relation to, to, uh, to the, the, the points. Uh, as you point out in your conclusions, the study refers to pre-crisis LDOs. And it's still difficult to, to, to ask your questions because you have answered most of them in the conclusions, and I think it's very interesting too. But what do you think? You, do you foresee it will be the result of a future study taking into account the uh, post-crisis uh, companies much more different? That would be one of, one of the points uh, that could uh, show different uh, behavior in, in private equities. Uh, Another question would be uh, the knowledge and technology intensity or other business attributes, what would have been the main target search behavior in drivers of LBO during the crisis years? I mean, do they, uh, might they have changed the, the way of doing things and looking for different things different than yeah. the, the, the results of the study? And another point would be if the payback focus of, of these companies, these kind of companies, could be the reason for, for the results that you have shown up. I mean, the way of behaving in, when they are in the company, the private equities differs from the managers before the, the, the private equity is, is inside. Okay. So I have so many questions. Uh, no, no, no. If, if, if. But there is another point that also the pre-crisis and post-crisis could be different. Uh, and I don't know if uh, what is your opinion about the rates of interest, because Depending on this payback focus, or even the uh, internal rate of uh, return of each investment, it could be also different for, for the results of pre-crisis pre and post-crisis uh, analysis. Okay. 
And I think one of the main contributions of these papers that shows that technological innovation is significantly less sensitive to LPOs than non-technological innovations. And you point out that the profile and expertise of private equity firms are more related to, to non-technological in innovation. Do you think that the private equity firm profile that, uh, that uh, could make that this investment is made by specialized firms in technology and different uh, to the non-technological firms? Could it be another point of uh, checking the variable? And in relation with control variables, in the study you have used age, size, sales, I, I know the restrictions that you have mentioned about the, the, the data, but do you think it could be possible that uh, results after LBO and before LBO could be a, a good uh, variable to measure the effectiveness of the, of the LBO in such a way? I know the restrictions, but yeah. Right, thank you. That's uh, or Hello? No. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. And uh, how, how long do I have? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, then I've got time. <laughs> so um, pre-post crisis, uh, this is definitely something that um, uh, I mean, if we had the the data, we would definitely uh, like to do. And then uh, it, it is it is this this is in the realm of things that are not impossible. It is in the realm of things that are hard because that will require us to ask the UNS to match a new bunch of, of, of companies, which is not obvious that they would do, but it could happen. So if they do that, we, we would be able to, to, to uh, look if uh, the results are, are different after the crisis. And now that we have new CIS weights, uh, I think we have two or three more CIS weights after that. So this is something that could be done. Now what? Do I expect things to be different? They probably are. Probably are different. They are different both in the way that, that, that private equity selects the companies and in the way they manage the investment um, and in the amount of leverage that uh, you don't have the same leverage to today or after the crisis. You don't have the same leverage you had before the crisis. And with a different leveraging of the company, the, the, the type of effects that you observe are probably going to be different. So yeah, I expect it to be different. It is hard to say how uh, how different, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it is different. And it's definitely something that would be worth uh, studying. Uh, the, uh, the it is you know this also creates a uh, uh, this is one of those cases where having more data is not necessarily a good thing because one of uh, one of our uh, assumptions for the identification of the of the endogeneity is that the selection criteria here are more or less the same as they are there. Now, since we know, I mean, we have a reasonable expectation that after the crisis, the uh, the selection criteria have changed, uh, you cannot really pull all these data in a single sample uh, because you know that your, your, your identification assumption is violated. So, so uh, doing this analysis would prove, prove to be tricky econometrically. Uh, but there, it's definitely something that is very, very interesting to do, and we definitely uh, hope that we'll have the, the opportunity to do it. The, um, now, another thing that, that um, uh, the, the very, very interesting um, comment you had was about the, the difference between uh, private equity with a technological focus and those that are kind of general purpose. Um, if you, you're definitely, I mean, we, do, we haven't thought of that, uh, but if you may expect to have any action over there, uh, that's probably for the, for the private equity investors that, has, that are either uh, specialized in a specific sector, high-tech sector, or in general in high-tech investments. So, um, and this is, again, something that is uh, hard to do, but not impossible to do, because we we don't have that information now, but it's an information that, at least in principle, uh, we could have, um, and that's that's definitely an interesting uh, addition to to the to the analysis we have. The um, now something that is uh, probably something that we will not be able to have is uh, is information about the uh, the the say the. Prof the Results of the of the of the LDO. So whether the LDO was kind of successful or not. This is probably something that we're not going to have 
um, because it is very, it's actually very difficult to, to, to know whether an, an LDO was successful or not in general. So it is very hard to get one measure to say that this was a successful LDO. Because either you had the IRR that you typically don't have, uh, it's, it's an information that is typically not disclosed at the deal level. You have that for the fund, but not for the deal. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the accounting uh, returns uh, are a very imprecise uh, measure of, of whether this was successful or not. Uh, so this is, this is probably uh, among the things that we would, we would not be able to do. Uh, we, can we can probably do the others. I don't know whether we will do that, but we could, at least in principle. Uh, that that uh, is something that is, uh, I mean, on paper, very interesting, but we would not be able to do that. Um, and yeah, then, then you had a question whether the, the payback focus of, of uh, private equity would explain this. It definitely it does. It definitely does. Uh, and it's, that's exactly what was what's, what's driving what's happening here. Uh, the companies with different um, uh, strategic advantage get the type of support that is more in line with the with their strategic advantage, then that's because the private equity wants to improve the value where the value is. So, uh, so that's that's absolutely that that's what what's explained to me that there's also yet. Uh, sure. Yeah. First of all, I'm amazed that the the English statistical office is so efficient because yeah, it's yeah, yeah. you don't get that at all. <laughs> you you get data and emerge it for us. Now let, let me let me tell you one thing before before you say they are efficient. They, I mean, they are amazing. They are amazing people. Uh, the uh, the this uh, the, I mean the we got access to this data uh, for a European project where Andor and Frederic were were part of. Um, so this this uh, project, the name of the project was Data Without Borders, because the problem you have with the CIS data is that every country has its own, but there is no way you can run a, a European study. Because each of those statistical offices has signed a, a, a confidentiality agreement with the company, so they cannot really share the data. So the problem is that it would be amazing if we could have this uh, study on, on a European data set. But you cannot do it. I mean, we have this data in Italy, for instance. If you want to use this data, you have to go to Rome, and then they are somewhere, and you have to find the data, and then you know, ask them to, crop, to, to match this data with other information. So that's probably the same thing that would happen here. Uh, so the data without borders, but borders are still there. There's no Schengen for data. <laughs> okay, my second point is about the, uh, a different uh, way to look at the, how to split the sample. Because you split the sample looking at the, oh, yeah. the industries. Uh, but yeah, it was also on one of the questions. you remember yeah. in our paper, uh, SBE paper, about financial constraints? Uh, yeah. The equity, uh, when we look at buyouts, uh, there are different types of buyouts. Yeah. It's not the same as family buyout, a oh, yeah, sure. buyout and subsidiary, a yeah. buyout from a company that is uh, taken and covered by, by government, yeah. when compared to public to private buyout. Uh, so the strategic dimension is only there in all of them except P2Ps. So yeah. if you have the, the possibility, or did you have the possibility of including with the names of the buyouts the type of buyout that was uh, <laughs> this is the, um, so you have, um, uh, going, back, going back to my, my early uh, uh, reply, so you have the, the, the things that you cannot do, the things that, that you could do in the future, and then you, this, is, this is the kind of thing that you, you wanted why you haven't done it in the first place. Mm -hmm. so, um, so definitely, we, we wish we had that information. That was, that was easy to ask because we knew. Uh, what type of LDOs we had, uh, but when we asked the ONS to, 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 to match, uh, we didn't specify whether they could leave that information. So the only thing we, we know now about these companies is, is we, we just know this is a company. So this, we have a row of data with all the answers to the questionnaire, and we know, okay, well, this is a company that had an LDO in uh, 2002. You don't know the name of the company, you don't know the name of the private equity investor, and you don't know what type of LDO that was. And there is a limit to the amount of information that they can add because they don't want you to figure out who the respondent was. Uh, but I think that, that it would have been a great idea on our side to keep that piece of information in there to distinguish different types of, of LDOs because I'm, I'm sure that that's definitely something else that is, that is playing there. 
Because in uh, P2Ps you would find the first, like in low tech, and in the other you would find the, the strategic approach. Sure, sure. So yeah, that that's definitely something that that uh, I'm I'm not sure that that alone would explain our results, but that's something else that 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 that, that, that could be done in this paper to, to see what are different types, different motives for the for the for the LBO, uh, then explain different post LBO behavior and innovation. That's definitely something that we should. Uh, Change in process. So, if you're a bank, you're changing process. Well, I'm going to be an IT thing. And if you are a, a manufacturer, a change in process could be a change in the hardware. So, new machinery as a change in the process. So, this is kind of sector uh, specific. So, in different sectors would have different type of process innovation depending on what the process looks like. Uh, so, there is no. We don't have a distinction in uh, how much of that is IT related or non IT related. I think that the um, the information is available in uh, in the CIS survey. I think that they ask companies how much IT expenditures they have. Uh, so and you work to the agency. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's an information that we we probably we, we can have that. So it's it's there already. So I just have to go to London and get back my my my, my do file to uh, to to have that. So that, that's that's easy to do. Um, I'm not sure how many. Um, uh, how many data points we have about IT expenditures, but I'm pretty sure that it's there. It's something that we could do. Because, uh, you know, the, 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 pro the problem is that one of the limitations we have with this data uh, is that all those variables are, are zero or one variables. So either you have product innovation or you don't, uh, which is kind of a pity because maybe you had three new products, maybe you had one, and for us it's the, difference, the, the only difference we see is whether you have none or at least one. Uh, so if you, have a, if you have a company that is doing one and one that is doing ten, they look exactly the same to us, which clearly uh, restricts our ability to, uh, to you know, describe what's, what's happening. Uh, but there are some, some variables like IT expenditures that are uh, pound, uh, so we know how many thousand pounds were spent in IT during the three years, and uh, we can scale that by the turnover of the company and have a percent. So that will be a continuous variable between zero and, uh, well, in principle, an infinite amount of money or an infinite percent. So it is a, at least that will be a continuous variable, uh, which will be an interesting thing to have uh, in addition of these decontinuous variables that we have. And it will probably be easier to, to, to treat. And one more question. Do you, do you know that about any specific incentive in taxes or, or other financial allowances that you may have in the UK that may distort the... Sure. I mean, there's... there's, there's uh, the uh, there is... Um, I mean, the, the UK had uh, many things going on in the 10 years we had there. Changes in the tax system. Uh, uh, there, they had, there are uh, subsidies to innovation, changing the way that the R&D can be deducted. So many things have changed in the UK over the period. So that's, that doesn't uh, work on our advantage. So the way we are, we are controlling for that is that we have, um, we have, we have period dummies uh, so that to the extent to which this is biasing all the companies uh, more or less in the same way, we control for that. And uh, we also have regional dummies because the UK is a, is a country with very, very different uh, regions in terms of, uh, of economic performance and innovation. So that's also something that could distort our result. 
because of course you have a lot more LBOs in London than you have, uh, I don't know, uh, I know. So you have a lot more um, LBOs in, in London than, uh, I don't have that for LBOs, but you have a lot more LBOs in London than you have, I don't know, in Northern Ireland. Right? And, and the, economic, the, the, the economic system is also different in, in these two regions. Uh, so we control for that with these, these regional dummies, uh, which is a very brute way of controlling for these things, but uh, that's, that's you know, the best thing we could. We could. Uh, but definitely you, you have to control for these things, because this is definitely something that would distort the results otherwise. Yeah, for example, well, I was thinking about buying a company with a partnership, for example, that do that partnership that that, that, I mean, this, there, there's, there's plenty of things that have changed. So, yeah, uh, this is this potentially would be a problem. Uh, the, um, the the only way we're controlling for that is with period topics. Uh, uh, the uh, I, I'm not really sure whether this. I mean, I cannot come up with one. Example of a change in regulation in the in the UK that would distort our results. Even I mean, after we control for period dumps, I, I I cannot come up with any uh, change in regulation. If if I knew about that change in regulation, I could control for that. As far as I know, there's nothing that is distorting our results. It could be, but I'm not aware of that. about the deal, uh, knowing what were the terms of the deal, that would be, that would, I mean, I would, I would love to have that information. And I, and I think that uh, this is, this is a, a study that even if you don't have the, the detailed information about innovation, even if you have only R&D, but if you know something about the deal, if, if you have very detailed information about the deal, that would be a very interesting study to make. Maybe with a, a lower, small uh, Sure, example. sure. So we don't need that. The, there is a, you know, there is not, I, I don't think there's much uh, literature out there that is uh, studying the, the, the impact of different say, deal structures on innovation. There's a lot that could be done. Problem is that that's another, you know, it, it is very, very difficult to, to have systematic and uh, reliable information about the, the, the terms of the deal. So the, the only studies that I'm aware of that are doing that uh, have uh, information from one private equity that discloses all, you know, these are the deals that I've done. You don't, you, you don't name me, uh, and, uh, but these, these are all, you know, this, this is the, the terms of all the deals that I've done. And you cross them uh, with, with information about the companies, and then you do your study. Uh, but you can, you know, it is very hard to do that on a, on a larger scale. Yeah, right. uh, but it, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And, uh, and just a description of the, of the terms of the, of the private equity deals. Uh, that would be already very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. If you have that information, no, 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 no. Uh, that's, see, that's Robert. <laughs> you know, nobody has that. But yes, Mark Wright. Oh, uh, Mark Wright has that for, for yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's an interesting thing. So, um, the, in, in the UK, uh, the, there's this, this research team uh, uh, led by Mark Wright, and they have a lot of information, especially about M MBOs and MBIs. Uh, so one possible extension of this work, uh, I, I was discussing this with Mike, is to use their information about M MBOs and MBIs and cross them with the CIS data. So again, you can have a lot of much information when you merge, merge it. So. Exactly. So again, I, I will I will have the same kind of problem, uh, but you know, uh, if, if if you can get at least some of that information into the CIS and at least play with some of that, uh, that would already give you a lot more flavor 
about what these, uh, these parallel equities are doing. Because here, the only thing you know is whether a, par a parallel equity is there or not. That's the only thing you know. And it clearly, I mean, that's a very, very uh, simplistic description of, 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 of NPOs. There's a lot more about that that, that we wish we had. Some of that we can have, and uh, some of that will remain a wish for the time being. And, uh, Any other questions? Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.